Hi everyone, I'm Sanya Faruqi and you are watching the Sanya Faruqi show. Welcome to our latest series called Women and Human Rights, a series where I'll be speaking to human rights practitioners, advocates and policy makers from around the world to discuss topics related to human rights. Today joining us, we have Maria Dimitriva. She is a longtime women's rights activist and national gender expert with the Democracy Development Center, an NGO that works on the development of civil society and state of law in Ukraine. Based in Kyiv, Maria has worked as an expert with various governmental co commissions and public councils under government ministries of Ukraine, currently leads the Women, Peace and Security section of the Public Council under the Parliamentary Interface faction equal rights caucus maria remained in ukraine after the russian invasion on february 24th 2022 turning her focus to connecting foreign and ukrainian women's initiative to provide humanitarian relief efforts thank you so much maria i do understand it's a very difficult and a very busy time for you you've been out on the road and uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the sanya faruki show Thank you, Sanya, for inviting me. It's my honor to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, you know, it's been 77 days since the attack on Ukraine began. I had a conversation with one of your colleagues just uh, you know, a few days ago, and you also are amongst the few who has chosen to stay back in Ukraine. You're fighting back. You are doing what you're doing. Um, I just want to start by asking you, how are you? coping? How is your family doing? How has it been, you know, uh, with, with the war, with the humanitarian crisis, with food crisis? There's just so much going on. So how has it been for you so far? Uh, let's start with pointing out that I'm not one of few. Uh, there are 42 million Ukrainians, and with 5 million gone abroad, we still are 37 million people here in the country. And I was lucky enough, uh, the suburb of Kyiv where I live was not bombarded and was uh, pretty safe throughout the hostilities near the capital. And uh, my family is safe. And right now we are visiting with my mother in, west, uh, in the west of the country. So, but it, it is not like we are internally displaced. We are just visiting and going to go back in a couple of weeks back to Kyiv. Talking about the situation, especially for young boys and girls who are caught up in the conflict and it's growing worse by the minute. And this also includes women, pregnant women, old people. Can you give us a sense of what you're seeing is happening on the ground and around you and what has been the impact of this very horrible, brutal ongoing war in Ukraine right now? Uh, well, uh, I must admit that having two years of COVID before this uh, pretty much prepared us uh, for what is going on right now. The schools are closed, but uh, education is going on. Uh, children are taking their classes online. Uh, the, we have electricity, we have gas, we have running water, uh, but those areas affected by the hostilities directly uh, that were liberated by the Ukrainian army are now rapidly rebuilding. Uh, immediately after the uh, sappers clean the territory from all the ordnance and debris and mines left by the Russians. Uh, the the uh, local people and um, visiting builders, uh, they all clean up the streets, they restore the infrastructure. So where there are no Russians, the life goes on. But we do have major problems with fuel uh, because Russians deliberately destroyed our uh, petroleum uh, hosting uh, areas. And uh, right now in a lot of areas, we don't have running public transportation because they don't have fuel. And uh, for private transportation, uh, it, it is a quest to find where you can fill uh, your car. This uh, puts some major hindrances on delivering food, but so far in those areas where uh, the hostilities are over, where the Ukrainian army is in control, uh, we don't have any uh, food scarcities. The problem is that we do have enough food, 
The problem is how to deliver it in those areas controlled by Russians or heavily bombarded by Russians. Yeah. And uh, we are well aware of the issues uh, at the international food market caused by Russian blockade of Ukrainian ports through which Ukrainian wheat has been exported. So uh, we, we will manage. The problem is that uh, the world is facing hunger because of the Russians' actions. And I find it very weird that people from those countries that face the hugest amount, the degree of uh, impending hunger, they are voting for Russia. Russia is starving them, not us, but well, that's international politics for you. So uh, again, where, where there is no war, we are managing, we are coping, we are rebuilding, we are supporting each other. Where there are hostilities, uh, it, it has been difficult. And uh, as a feminist, I want to point out that the behavior of Russia, not only Putin, but the entire country towards Ukraine is pretty much a behavior of an abusive partner of many years who wants his property in his complete control. And we know that when a woman tries to leave her abuser, the uh, probability that he will kill her in the, in the process of her leaving is six times higher than if she just chooses to stay. So this is what we, we are seeing right now. Uh, the gas lighting, uh, the um, deprivation of um, electricity, of gas, the, the blackmailing of, of our neighbors with uh, gas again, and uh, what they are doing with shelling us at night, this is sleep deprivation. This is stress. And when you are stressed all the time, it is difficult to assess your uh, opportunities and your actions. And it has been very difficult for, for the entire country because we keep having night uh, air raid alarms mm -hmm. and uh, with the, the discussed heavily a threat of nuclear bombardment of Ukraine. Uh, we have very few choices whether to stay at home or to go to the bomb shelters. And if you go have to go to the bomb shelter three times a night, yeah. you uh, yeah. day in and day out, you are very stressed out and your sleep patterns destroys, are destroyed. So it has been difficult. Yeah, I can imagine it's, um... This, this has been, um, you know, going on for 77 days and uh, we, coming back to talking about, you know, the risk of exploitation, sexual violence, you know, along with the massive food shortage that you're talking about, despite rebuilding efforts and, and uh, you know, rehabilitation efforts, basic necessity shortage, how can the international community and organizations at this point help? Um, a lot of international organizations are now uh, coming to Ukraine. A lot of them have been working here for the last eight years, ever since the, this, this part of war began. Uh, and uh, we do see that they are trying their best, uh, but their efforts at the central level don't always translate into actual actions in, uh, at the local level. And we have seen that until recently, the International Red Cross, uh, they were collecting huge amount of donations in the West, but uh, they would uh, bring uh, drinking water uh, for uh, th that is severely overpriced in glass bottles to a city of Dnipro, which has its own water supply instead of uh, you know helping with evacuation of people from the occupied areas and what they did in uh, Mariupol they uh, uh, they organized finally uh, an evacuation route but instead of bringing you uh, Ukrainian citizens directly to the areas controlled by the Ukrainian government. They started by bringing them to the to another part occupied by Russia, which is not as heavily bombarded. And it ended up with uh, having those people uh, uh, taken to the filtration camp and uh, the, the local 
so-called authorities, checked whether those people were involved with the Ukrainian army, whether they were politicians local, whether they were uh, activists or volunteers. And uh, after the, uh, only after they took away those people, they would let the other evacuees go to the Ukrainian territory, br uh, breaking up families. Uh, so uh, the International Red Cross is doing something, but this something is not enough and it is uh, not well thought through. So, uh, and um, we also uh, have uh, a significant, ah, yeah, what, what international community can do? Uh, the international community can stop buying Ukraine, uh, Russian gas and uh, petrol. When they stop buying Russian petrol, they will stop funding this war. And the entire amount uh, of losses by Russia due to the sanctions has been dwarfed by the money paid to Russia throughout this period. So the West is inconsistent. With one hand, they are taking away, and with the other hand, they are giving it back to Russia. So I understand that all uh, their um, fuel systems are heavily dependent on Russia, but this uh, means that they have to take a very strong, uh, very piercing look at how their systems are organized and why until now they haven't uh, weaned themselves from Russian oil and switched to uh, renewable energy. Uh, what else can be done? Um, we have been hearing about attempts to abduct Ukrainian women and Ukrainian girls at the border crossings uh, from Ukraine to Poland, uh, from Poland to Germany. And uh, the international organizations and local NGOs are publishing booklets like uh, look out for uh, these uh, things. They may signal that you are in danger of being trafficked. But imagine you have been sleeping in a basement of your house for three weeks under bombardment. Sleep deprivation, stress, no uh, decent food, no decent water. You have been on the road for a week to get out of this area. And on the border crossing, you don't know the language. You have never been abroad. You don't know what to do. Imagine this amount of stress. How can we reasonably expect that women in this situation will have the mental resources to look for those booklets and take this information in, in factor in it in their decision? If they see a friendly face who offers them a ride and promises that they will be having a roof over their head and food for their children, who would blame them if they decide to take uh, up on that opportunity? So what we need is uh, that uh, the uh, Western countries uh, in Europe and Northern America and Northern Africa and pretty much every other country, uh, we need a severe system of punishment for men who buy women and children for sex. So basically they buy them to rape them and uh, we cannot mince our words about this. This is paid rape and it has to be punished. International legislation is very clear on that. Prostitution is a form of severe violence against women. So we cannot uh, look the other way. We have to look straight at it and be very clear. You cannot buy people for sex. It is not sex that you buy, you, you buy control. So we need to punish the clients and we need to punish the pimps and the traffickers. If we have that, we will trample demand and this by itself will reduce significantly the number of women and children sold into prostitution, enticed into yeah. prostitution, forced into prostitution because otherwise they cannot provide for themselves. So that would be my second major uh, ask. First, yeah. stop buying their gas. Second, uh, punish the uh, buyers and thus stop the proliferation of prostitution. Yeah. And this vulnerability is mostly identified once the women and children cross the borders because then they have no idea what's next. Where do mm -hmm. they go? What do they do? Um, what can be done by neighboring countries to help those leaving Ukraine right now? What do you think is missing? One is 
yes, of course, the pamphlet, even uh, your colleague discussed about how it's very difficult at a time when you're leaving your country or in a state of trauma, the last thing you will do is stop and read posters. And for a few, mm -hmm. language also could be a problem. Um, uh, you know, age is a problem. Understanding the context of what's being explained is a problem. So one is having better kits given to individuals who are entering new border countries, uh, neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what else can be done? What do you think uh, from your observation, what's happening to the refugees once they are leaving Ukraine and becoming refugees into the neighboring countries that are welcoming them, which is really good for them. At least they have that outlet. Mm -hmm. But what do you think could be done to make it better? Uh, our Minister of Internal Affairs uh, has been asking whether it is possible to introduce a system of um, uh, tracking uh, devices uh, like a, a child may wear so they can be tracked. Uh, so like they exit Ukraine, they get a tracking device and then they can be put into the system and followed through because a lot of refugees are not staying in Poland. They are moving further because Poland is saturated. Uh, so uh, a tracking device would be nice, a tracking system that would take into account all those people leaving and uh, the system that uh, would provide uh, Ukrainian authorities and Ukrainian embassies to be able to contact them, uh, to keep in touch with them. Uh, another uh, thing that can be done is for uh, local women's initiatives and local women's NGOs to get into contact with Ukrainian uh, expats in those areas and together uh, engage those newcomers uh, so that they have a, a network that they can rely on, that they are not alone, uh, that they are not as vulnerable. When you have people looking out for you, both Ukrainian citizens living in those countries and local women's groups, it will be much easier to uh, both keep track of them and provide them support when they need it and in the form they need it. I cannot imagine what you must be going through, but just share with us what is your everyday life and routine now? Um, mm. In the middle of the war, do you think this is going to end anytime soon? And um, just how are all of you surviving this? Uh, you know, I met this uh, invasion. Uh, the, the war began, uh, this iteration of war began eight years ago. Uh, and uh, for those who are not familiar with uh, Eastern European history, Russia has been... Uh, invading Ukraine repeatedly over the last 300 years. A hundred year ago, hundred years ago, when the Russian empire dissolved and Ukraine proclaimed its independence, uh, Russia first acknowledged that independence and then invaded Ukraine and took over. And we ended up with having uh, the uh, Holodomor, uh, which starved basically. It was an artificial man-made famine that starved 8 million people. So um, when Russia invaded Georgia uh, in 2008, it was obvious that we will be next because it didn't meet any, uh, any resistance from the international community. So uh, it was the reintroduction of real politik. Who's the strongest, who's the bully, he gets to dictate the rules. They didn't get any pushback. And it was just in the question of time when they would invade us. So when they did in 2014, they started to, uh, you know, twist the truth uh, to promote this post-truth um, setting in which it doesn't matter whether it is true or it is not. There is no truth. It is all so complicated. And again, the international community swallowed it, a uh, line, hook, and sinker, and didn't respond in full scale as it was supposed to be, according to the principles uh, that were uh, play, placed in the UN Charter, that every country that has its um, borders has to stay independent and uh, cannot be invaded. So the, the system in which uh, uh, everybody agreed to uh, adhere to the international law, it was destroyed. So this entire system of interactions and mutual uh, respect 
Russia pretty much destroyed it all. Every small autocrat that thinks that he has a nuclear bomb or he has the right to invade their neighbors, they all got a free for all card. So uh, when uh, the, uh, this invasion in uh, February began, I was uh, uh, conducting a three day training for young women peace builders. And uh, my family was calling me and telling me, why are you staying in downtown Kiev? They're going to bomb it. Go back here. This is safe here. And I told them, how can I leave? I have 25 young women here. They came to listen. They came to learn. They cannot leave right now. It is my responsibility to stay with them. So it was the first day that we had air raid sirens. Uh, we spent at least two hours uh, in the bomb shelter at that hotel. That hotel now advertises itself as a very safe place because they have their own bomb shelter. Imagine that. So we spent there two days and after almost all of those girls were gone, either brought to their relatives and friends or uh, they returned to their home, uh, some of them who were from Kherson, which was invaded at the moment, they stayed at that hotel uh, for another two weeks and our organization paid for it because we couldn't have sent them uh, back to the area with hostilities. But at first, we really thought that it will be over soon because of how absurd it was. It, it was difficult to just accept that it was happening. And we thought that our army would just throw the Russians back away because we are now much stronger and we are equipped. But no, unfortunately, we didn't manage to do that. And based on what we see, we may be in for a long haul here. And uh, with, uh, even with all the weapons that are being sent now to us, this is all very good, but way too late. This is something that had to be done years ago. And because of that, the world is pretty much on the brink of World War III. And um, I don't know whether we will be able to avoid that, even if we win, even if Russia doesn't try to invade other countries, which they are pretty much are planning to do and declaring this on their TV uh, repeatedly. They want to take over Poland, they want to take over Finland, they want to take over Lithuania. Uh, this is why Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia and other countries uh, in Eastern Europe are so adamant in supporting Ukraine. They know when we fall, they will be next. And um, to though uh, there are, and uh, in the last couple of months, a lot of Western intellectuals, which shocked me, have been saying that uh, Ukraine should have surrendered and that we should surrender right now to uh, save Ukrainians' lives, uh, to uh, stop the war from happening. This is pretty much the same logic uh, when people tell a woman who is being raped that if she stops resisting, it will end uh, sooner. So mm -hmm. instead of helping her get rid of the rapist, they just tell her to give up because they find her shrieks irritating. This is what is happening here. And what those Western intellectuals don't understand that if Russia takes over Ukraine, they will just draft everybody and advance on the rest of Europe, just like they did in World War II. And if they have Ukrainians as part of their army, they will be unstoppable. So everybody who doesn't want World War III in Europe in Northern America and in the rest of the world has to understand it is in their best interest to stop Russia now. The sooner we stop it, the better the chances that we avoid the full scale, full blown World War III. Yeah. On that note, Maria, I'm going to wrap up, but thank you so much. Uh, more power to you and please stay safe. I'm truly grateful that you took the time out to come and speak to us and thank you for everything that you've said. Um, and, um, you know, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, I know this is uh, the last thing you want to tell somebody who's going through a lot is that you're very brave, but the fact is, all of you are very brave and the world is supporting and standing in solidarity with what's happening in Ukraine. And we can only hope and pray that the effects and impact of war 
will not hit the women and children as we've seen the way it has hit. We've seen it in Syria. We've seen it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in Iraq. We've seen what devastation does. So one can only hope that um, it would be a lesson and, and the way everybody in Ukraine is fighting back, I hope um you know it ends and we're all able to uh as as uh, you know your colleague and i discussed that uh, hope we meet for coffee for some time uh on mm-hmm. during better days so mm-hmm. let's just hope that happens but until then please stay safe and thank you again so much for joining us thank you we will drink coffee after we win yes likewise and we'll do a cheers to that as well <laughs> All right. And on that note, thank you so much for watching us. For those of you who have been following the Sanya Paruki show, I hope you will subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Spotify. I'm going to see you again next week. So stay tuned.